All right, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and kick off today's presentation, Garden Pests versus the Good Bugs. And this is one of my favorite topics, so I'm really glad you guys could all make it today. And uh, we're going to dive right into it because there's a lot to talk about. There's uh, a lot of good critters out there in your garden, uh, potentially waiting to help you. But here in Florida, many people feel like they're in a constant battle against pests in their landscape and in their gardens. And given the way a lot of landscapes are managed, it's really no surprise. To be perfectly honest, um, this sort of thing is not necessarily um, a place where a good bug is just going to be hanging out. So yeah, that poor hibiscus there on the corner uh, is pretty much going to be at the mercy of the aphids and mealybugs when they come to call. Like I was saying, uh, the way that a lot of landscapes are managed, it's not necessarily a kind of place that good bugs want to be hanging out. Same goes for um, some of the veggie gardens that I wind up seeing. Uh, these little veggie seedlings, there's not a whole lot to entice a uh, good bug to be hanging out here. And so they're kind of left hanging out in the breeze for when the mealybugs and aphids and all those nasty things come along. Um, and, you know, honestly, there's a reason that there's a booming business for mail order ladybugs. And then after releasing those thousand ladybugs you get within a short time, there's often none in sight again. Uh, so the thing is, good bugs need certain things to want to stick around. And if you're not providing those things, you're going to be trying to defend your landscape and your garden all by yourself from all the things that want to eat it. And here in Florida, that's a lot of things. Uh, and it can be pretty frustrating for a gardener. All right, so it can lead people down a path of increasingly strong pesticides, all that frustration. Uh, and when broad spectrum pesticides were first discovered, there was a lot of excitement about them uh, because they work really well. Um, they do their job, they kill bugs and they do it well. But more and more we're realizing they're not always the best choices, uh, both for us and for the environment. Uh, so today what I'm gonna talk about is welcoming the bugs back into your landscape uh, and how to do that the right way. All right, so one big problem with regular use of pesticides is that most bugs actually aren't pests. And in fact, there's an incredible diversity of insects out there that many people unfortunately never even get to see. Uh, so there's a fascinating uh, amount of wildlife that uh, you know can show up if you know where to look and you got the right conditions. Also, there's a lot of critters out there that depend on bugs for food. So whether you're talking about the lizards or the birds, the bats, the frogs and amphibians, um, there's a lot of things where insects make up a huge important part of that food web out there. All right, so a lot of folks keep popping in, uh, kind of late comers to the meeting, and I apologize, that's what that little yellow box is about. It keeps on uh, giving me a notification every time somebody comes into the waiting room. So um, hopefully once we kind of close things out and everybody gets into the meeting, I'm gonna quit having that little yellow box pop up. I apologize. All right, so, the big thing that I'm talking about today is the fact that many insects are actually beneficial, meaning that uh, not only are they cool to look at and uh, an important part of the food chain, but they can actually play important roles in helping you control pests and maintain this balance in your landscape ecosystem. So in Florida Friendly Landscaping, uh, we talk about attracting wildlife and we talk about managing pests responsibly, and these things really tie together hand in hand. So when we talk about attracting wildlife, it's not just about the pretty pollinators and beautiful birds, uh, although, you know, those are nice too. I enjoy seeing them in the garden. But it's also the question of when aphids show up on your plants, is anyone waiting there to greet them? And so we're going to talk all about this today. Uh, I'm going to give you guys three easy steps to attract the good bugs uh, to your landscape or your garden. But first, it doesn't do you any good if you're attracting all these beneficial insects, uh, if you're just likely to spray or squish them along with the bad guys. So before we talk about attracting them, let's actually meet some of these good bugs. Because um, it's important to be able to recognize them when they arrive. And uh, I just want to mention right off the bat, we're just barely going to scratch the surface of the variety of insects that can show up and be 
considered beneficial in your landscape. There are a ton of good bugs I couldn't fit in today's talk. So I'm going to talk about some common ones that you're likely to see. Uh, we won't really even get into things like big eye bugs that have a huge appetite for all sorts of stuff. Uh, we're not really going to talk about some of these ground beetles because most of the time they're out of sight, out of mind, just doing their thing. Um, but, you know, they're out there. There's all sorts of stuff uh, that's kind of crawling around on the ground doing a great job for you. Um, but what we're going to talk about is some of the more common ones. And I'm going to kick off with one that's uh, probably the classic example of a good bug for the garden. But the reason I want to talk about them is because of the simple fact that most people are really only familiar with adult ladybugs with the classic red and black color scheme. And often that's about where it ends. And that's pretty unfortunate because there are actually a ton of different species of lady beetles. So, yeah. Stop this real quick, share the screen one more time, and hopefully everybody's in that's going to be in, and we'll get that yellow box to quit showing up there. All right, so there's a ton of different species of lady beetles that can call your garden home, and not all the lady beetles are the classic shiny red with the black spots. So this little tiny orange and black one is actually one of the most common in my garden. Uh, for a sense of scale, that's actually a loquat leaf that it's walking across. So these things are tiny, like really tiny, um, about, you know, head of a pushpin small. Um, I'm constantly finding them on my herbs and veggies. You know, when I bring them inside, give them a rinse off, these things will start crawling up this side of the bowl. And I have to escort them back outside. Uh, but that's just one example. We've also got the reverse color scheme out there, kind of a classy black uh, color pattern going on with the twice stabbed lady beetle named because of those two red spots. Uh, so you can see this one is working on the scale problems that are going on on this Kunti plant. Um, and it's not only that there's different kinds of lady beetles that all look different. All lady beetles go uh, through a full metamorphosis, which basically means that juvenile lady beetles look absolutely nothing like the adults. So it doesn't do you much good if you're protecting all the adults uh, and you recognize them, but you're squishing or spraying all the babies right alongside with the aphids. Um, especially because a lot of times the adults just kind of make an appearance and it's the juvenile ladybugs that are really hanging out and doing the dirty work of cleaning up the aphid jobs. Uh, so for instance, right here, um, you've got a juvenile lady beetle right up there, uh, kind of going to work up top. You got the adult lady beetle that's probably having a snack and then working on laying some eggs uh, so that it's got a food supply for its next generation. Uh, so you can see they look nothing alike. And there's dozens of different species of predatory lady beetles. Each one looks a little different as adults and as juveniles. So here's one type. Uh, this is the underside of a basil leaf. Uh, here's another that's sitting up here climbing around on the fennel. Uh, you can see they've got this shape, a lot of them, that gives them a nickname, uh, the alligator stage. So uh, it kind of looks sort of like an alligator tail, but that's not even classic across the board. Uh, there's actually a lot of different shapes and forms of juvenile lady beetles. And some of them, uh, especially ones that prefer to feast on scale insects and mealybugs, actually look a bit like giant mealybugs themselves, which is kind of unfortunate because it gets a bit confusing and there's a lot of cases of mistaken identity where somebody sees this uh, fuzzy thing down on the bottom and thinks they're staring at a giant scary mealybug infestation that's about to begin. Um, so for comparison, mealybugs on the left, uh, typically they've got a lot of fuzzy fluffiness going on. There's usually a lot of them kind of clustered together. They look pretty flat up against the leaf. Uh, whereas the mealybug destroyer, typically these are gonna be bigger they're going to be faster. Um, mealybugs kind of sit still against the stem or the leaf, whereas mealybug destroyers look like they're on a mission. They're roaming around. Uh, they're kind of elevated on their legs, so it looks a little bit like a hovercraft going along rather than being flat up against the leaf. Um, they're going to be a little fluffier sometimes with these weird tendrils. So bigger, faster, fluffier, kind of roaming solo. You probably got the mealybug destroyer there. Um, also worth noting when it comes to lady beetles that in general right between that juvenile stage and the shiny adult stage there's actually a brief 
pupa stage that looks nothing like either one of them. So for instance, this little orange jelly bean looking thing is actually a lady beetle that's going through that stage of metamorphosis to change from juvenile to adult. Uh, and so, you know, what I really want you to take away from this is, this is the good bug that people think they're most familiar with. Uh, so, you know, if you didn't necessarily recognize some of these guys, uh, just wait until we move on to some of the other ones that are some of my favorites. All right, so moving on, we're gonna talk about lace wings. Now, these guys are some of my favorites. And they've got nicknames like aphid wolves, trash bugs, uh, all sorts of colorful names here. And we'll take a look at what's going on with them because they are pretty awesome to find. Most likely at some point or another, uh, you have seen lacewing eggs somewhere in your yard or maybe even on the handle of a door or a screen or arm of a chair or something. Now, if you ever see these, you really want to let them stay. Uh, because the bug that hatches out is a ferocious hunter of pests. So baby lacewings are nicknamed aphid wolves because these guys are such hungry hunters. Uh, they just, they devour the pests when they come charging through. Uh, now, I actually kind of think the way they thrash their heads back and forth, they remind me more of tiny versions of bee monsters uh, or bee movie monsters than a wolf. Um, but, you know, to each their own. So you can see on the right, there's some photos of different types of uh, lacewing larvae just going to town on aphids and spider mites and things like that. Now, seriously, if you're a small pest insect, these guys will be a terrifying sight to see coming straight towards you. Uh, they've got a voracious appetite and they just frantically race around your plants devouring any aphids, thrips, or mites they come across. Uh, and it's, it's kind of fun to watch them. But did I mention they're really tiny? Uh, so this is a, a mustard green leaf. That's my thumb for comparison. Uh, this guy was just going around and cleaning up the couple pests it could find. Uh, but yeah, it's really easy to potentially overlook these guys. Now, the lace wings that are known as trash bugs are a little more noticeable. So there's a couple different species that you can find in your yard. Some of them look like that last one that I was showing you. And uh, some of them look more like this. Now, the reason they're called trash bugs and what you've got going on there, um, for camouflage, they'll go ahead and cover themselves with the corpses and debris of the pests they've eaten recently, uh, plus whatever random stuff they find along the way. So if you see something on your plant that looks like pocket lint that's frantically patrolling every square inch of your plant, uh, you've got yourself a lacewing larva on patrol, and you should definitely let it be. Here's another example of a little larval lacewing. You can see it right here on uh, the middle of that rouge plant flower. Um, so these guys just kind of patrol every square inch up and down. Uh, here's another one that's looking really fuzzy and fluffy. It just looks like something you pulled out of your pocket, but it was in the middle of thrashing around this juvenile stink bug when I found it uh, right there on a pine needle. So larval lacewings, really awesome to find. Uh, my other favorite one that a lot of people don't recognize, but these guys don't get the credit they deserve, uh, would be surfed flies, also known as hoverflies or uh, flower flies. So we're going to talk a little bit about these guys because they're really cool. Now, hoverflies, the adults spend their days visiting flowers. Uh, many of them are actually bee mimics, meaning they don't sting, but they kind of look like they might. Um, they're often going to be uh, similar looking to a bee, but you're going to be able to tell them apart by these relatively large reddish looking fly eyes. Um, they've got tiny antennae that emerge right from the center of um, their face, if you would call it a face. Um, and they've got this very unique style of flight that is a very linear hovering pattern. So uh, it looks almost like a, a drone or a dragonfly in the way that it, it hovers uh, very interestingly around the flowers. All right, well, I'm glad to see a lot of folks showing up. Uh, it does mean I keep on getting this uh, box on top of the presentation, and I apologize for that, um, but it looks like people are just continuing to trickle in, so 
Um, apologize for that little yellow box. It's a little annoying, but it seems to just be par for the course right now with everybody coming in a little late. All right, so when it comes to hoverflies, uh, I tend to find the adults visiting tiny flowers all throughout the year. Uh, so here's one, for instance, checking out these uh, little scorpion tail flowers. Uh, in the wintertime, a great attractor seems to be sweet alyssum. Uh, it's really a spot where I just see them hanging out all the time. Uh, in the springtime, the fleabane, I've got a little patch of this that volunteers in my yard just absolutely covered in all sorts of different kind of hoverflies. So uh, the adults definitely will spot them hanging around these little tiny white flowers. Uh, Yopon holly is another one where I've been seeing a lot of them as those started to shift into bloom and the fleabane started to fade. But the adults are, you know, kind of minor pollinators. The larvae are really where the pest patrol action is at. And these guys, don't get nearly the credit they deserve. They don't really look like much to look at, um, but this is the big reason why you want those flowers attracting all those hoverflies in your garden. Because the larvae are absolutely voracious predators of aphids. And they don't look like they would be a very effective predator, but um, like lacewings, these guys put ladybugs to shame in terms of their appetite. So they're a bit like weird squirmy caterpillar looking critters almost uh, kind of a cross between like a caterpillar and a little green uh, maggoty grub deal um, but they don't have any legs uh, just a pointy snout end where the head end seems like it should be and they move in this very squirmy sort of way um, but they just basically squirm their way along sucking up aphids like their juice pouches and uh, they make ladybugs look like lazy freeloaders in comparison all right, so moving on, a uh, couple of classic examples of good bugs that people kind of grow up hearing about a lot, spiders, praying mantises, things like that. I'm going to talk just briefly about them because while they can certainly be beneficial and it's fun to see things like these little smiley orb weavers uh, hanging out and catching mosquitoes by the back door. Um, in truth, a lot of spiders and praying mantises are fairly equal opportunity predators, meaning essentially if something moves, it might be considered lunch. So, you know, you've got these little guys like this crab spider that hangs out on flowers. One day it might be a moth. The next day you might have the spiders catching the bees that are coming over to pollinate the flowers. Um, the same really goes for praying mantises. So overall, they're probably good to have in the garden. And if nothing else, their presence is usually a good sign that you've created a healthy habitat. Um, but they often get a disproportional amount of credit compared to things like lacewings and hoverflies uh, and the ones I'm going to talk about next. Uh, so don't get me wrong, these guys are fascinating critters, but they're not necessarily cleaning up your aphids and various other pests uh, the way that you would necessarily be led to believe. Um, but as long as I'm talking about them, I do want to kind of point out one neat thing about praying mantises and on the theme of how to attract and, and protect these guys in general. Um, you want to be able to recognize all those different life stages. For instance, this little thing on this uh, vine is actually the egg case for praying mantises. So there's uh, probably a couple dozen praying mantis eggs that will sit there all through the winter on this dead vine and they'll hatch out in the springtime waiting to patrol all around your garden or your yard and um, things like that. So, uh, you know, if you're cleaning up branches, uh, even if it seems like a, a dead branch, it doesn't hurt to give it a quick look once over because uh, something like this, you don't necessarily want to toss out in your yard waste. So go ahead and, you know, it's fine to just toss it in the corner of the yard, let it do its thing. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of a good reminder on that. Moving on though, I want to get back to some serious top tier beneficial insects. And we're going to talk wasps. Yes, wasps. Now, when you hear the word wasp, you probably think of something like these Polistes paper wasps. And if you're like many people, you have all sorts of negative feelings. Uh, and it's kind of understandable. You know, some of these can uh, be aggressive when they're around their nests, a small handful of wasps, really. Uh, but for the most part, there's a lot more reason to feel uh, fascinated by wasps than uh, scared by them. So, 
we'll kind of get into all the benefits of WASP in a second. I do want to address one thing about WASPs because uh, for some of us that like to support various butterflies in our gardens, uh, the idea of appreciating a group of predators that preys on caterpillars is a bit of cognitive dissonance. Uh, so I wind up hearing this a lot in gardening groups. You know, we really want to protect the butterflies and see them all grow up. Um, I promise you it's possible to create a functional habitat in your landscape where you can achieve a level of balance. You can support wasps and support butterflies together, even on the same plant. So it can be done. Uh, they are important players in the garden. They do sometimes, some of them prey on caterpillars, but you can get that balance right uh, if you're uh, creating a good habitat. So just getting that out of the way, because I know there's a lot of negative feelings about wasps, but moving on, we're gonna look at what makes them amazing. All right, so here's the thing. Wasps are actually an amazingly diverse group of critters. Uh, they come in a huge, astounding variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. And I kind of think of these as like the Ferraris or the big cats of the insect world. So they're sleek, they're shiny, they're highly specialized for their unique high performance roles. And each one has got a different thing that it's kind of specialized to do out there. So for instance, these potter wasps and mason wasps, they visit flowers for nectar and pollen, and then they build their specialized little nest pots and fill them up with things like uh, little caterpillars. And while they may occasionally be grabbing a caterpillar from your butterfly garden, uh, these ones prefer to be picking off smaller pests uh, that would be chewing up your trees, your shrubs, your lawns, your veggies, things like that. Now, of course, if those have all been sprayed to within an inch of their life, uh, these guys are going to take what they can get. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of times the only unsprayed safe caterpillars out there wind up being the same ones we're trying to raise and protect in our butterfly gardens. So ultimately, the more healthy, holistic habitat you can get, the more these guys can do their thing, your butterflies can do their thing, and so on. Uh, so fascinating kind of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, with these, one of the things that also affects them is they like to build their nests on the sides of windows and houses, different protected places. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of smart on their part, but it means that when we like to have our walls nice and clean and tidy, uh, these are constantly getting power washed off and hit with the broom handle and stuff like that. So, you know, if you're able to, try to let them be at least until you can see that the nest has opened up and uh, let out the next generation. So, cool critters. Uh, there's more on the UF Bugs featured creatures pages if you're really uh, wanting to check some of these out. All right, so let me see if I can get that yellow box to go away one more time. Maybe everybody's rolled in and it's going to be here. All right. Um, so here's another example of just one of the fascinating diversity of wasps that show up. Uh, this is one that I just saw recently for the first time. It's called a great golden digger wasp. So the adults are really docile and they actually feed on nectar, uh, which is what I saw this one doing for just a few days hanging out at my fennel patch. Um, but what I learned about them is that the females actually will go around and collect and immobilize critters like crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids, and they'll provision their nests for their larvae. So, you know, it's one of these things where each wasp kind of has its own specialty, uh, and they're off doing all sorts of interesting things like that. So if you've got grasshoppers that are chewing up your plants, um, you know, maybe you don't have enough of these guys hanging around doing their thing. Now, where it really gets fascinating, though, with the diversity of wasps is that a lot of them are actually super tiny and you never even know they're there. So for instance, what I'm gonna start talking now is a little bit like sci-fi gruesome. Uh, there's a ton of small, uh, you know, what I would almost call micro wasps. Uh, so small you would probably think these things were a gnat. And for some of these tiny species of wasps, like these braconid wasps, um, rather than catch prey to feed their young, these guys just lay their eggs right inside their host. So they just, you know, they sit the, the next generation right there, all you can eat buffet. Uh, and it's kind of gruesome. The larvae will basically mature inside the host and then make their way out to the surface. So what you see covering this little caterpillar, uh, those are actually the cocoons 
uh, where they're pupating and getting ready to fly off and start patrolling the rest of the garden. Um, so fascinating little thing about uh, wasps like this is a lot of them can actually pick up on chemical cues emitted by the plants as they're getting chewed on. So it's almost like the plants are sending out an SOS signal to the wasps and the wasps will hone in on that and pick up that cue and that's how they'll find uh, the prey that they need uh, for their next generation. Now here's another type, even smaller than the last. Um, believe it or not, some wasps are so tiny, they actually specialize in parasitizing aphids. So those swollen tan papery shells there are actually known as aphid mummies. And on some you can actually see the little exit hole where the adult, wasp, uh, the adult, adult wasp emerged. Uh, so, you know, whenever you're having a bad day, just think about how bad it would be to be an aphid mummy. Uh, so, yeah, the diversity of stuff going on in your garden, uh, it's, you know, beneficial wasps out there doing their thing, pretty incredible. Now, just want to rewind for a quick second and point out that that's actually the same plant, um, this one here. Uh, this is actually the same plant I showed earlier when talking about the hoverfly larvae. Uh, so you can actually see, looking closely at this, uh, there's a couple of aphid mummies in this photo. And this sort of brings up an interesting point. A lot of this stuff is so small and easy to overlook if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, you know, it's no wonder that a lot of the good guys wind up getting taken out with the bad guys. Uh, so when you spot a few pests, always take a closer look flip a few leaves, uh, you're often going to be surprised with the level of control you've already got going on uh, once you start to establish this little natural balance out there. So in fact, within about a week from taking this picture with zero intervention, uh, this plant here went from looking like this, which, you know, frankly looks pretty scary, um, to looking like this. Now, uh, do you recognize that little orange blob there? Kind of looks like a little orange jelly bean. There's your ladybug pupa. So we had almost total cleanup of this cranberry hibiscus over at one of the demonstration gardens, uh, just from the um, lace wings, hoverflies, uh, the wasps and things like that doing their thing. Uh, so one of the key points kind of to bring home from all that is you really want to do a close look at who's already on the scene, try to figure out what level of imperfection you're willing to accept temporarily, uh, and sometimes what level your plants can sustain uh, before you feel the need to intervene. You know, it won't always work out like this, but sometimes, uh, you know, you can pretty much let the good guys do the thing. All right, so I spent more time talking about wasps here than any other beneficial insect because I really want uh, to share this understanding that I've been uh, getting more and more as I realize how fascinating and diverse these guys are in your landscape uh, and how intertwined this whole balance of the landscape ecosystem really is uh, with all of our landscape choices, uh, both what we plant and how we take care of it. So for this last one that I'm going to show you guys, uh, this is kind of a good example. This is a small non-aggressive wasp that is a frequent visitor here to the springtime flowers in my garden. So I've been seeing these hanging out on the Black Eyed Susans and things like that. And it feeds solely on pollen and nectar as an adult. Now to raise the next generation, these things actually seek out burrowing grubs. So like the kind that can be turf pests. And it lays its eggs right there in the grub burrow. And there's typically one single generation of these wasps per year. And so for me, this kind of really ties the whole thing all together and brings us back to the beginning because picture what happens when a beneficial insect is in Florida and its annual life cycle depends on an underground stage where it's a parasitoid of a pest that makes brown spots in lawns. That predator prey balance is going to break down really fast. And I can guarantee the pests will always come back faster than the predators. All right, so talking about all this, now let's really get into the, uh, the ways that you can help 
attract and support all these good bugs that we've been talking about. All right, so for one thing, it's going to take a little bit of a shift in perspective about how the landscape is designed and maintained. So if you've got something that's kind of looking like this, um, you know, you're not necessarily going to have the good guys just ready and raring to go. Although once you start making some changes, it actually is surprising how quickly things start to come back together. All right. Now, ultimately, there's a couple reasons this isn't a really attractive place for a good bug to hang out. For one, where's all that nectar and pollen that we were talking about? Where's all the shelter, um, the places to lay eggs and things like that? Where's all the good uh, food for the larval generations of all the good bugs? You know, if there's no uh, pests or everything's constantly getting knocked back uh, to the point where it's perfectly manicured and you know, every little leaf has to be perfect, you're not going to have those good guys hanging out and waiting. So same kind of goes for this. You know, what incentive is there for those good bugs to be hanging out? Uh, it's, it's not really a good place for them. You're going to see this pass it right on by. All right, so one of the running themes in just about all the pictures I showed today uh, was that I showed a lot of good bugs visiting a lot of flowers. And while people often focus on the pretty colors when it comes to flowers, uh, flowers can and should be thought of as doing a lot more in your landscape. Because most beneficial insects actually rely on nectar and pollen at some point in their life cycle. Uh, some just use it as an alternative food source when prey are scarce. Others feed on it exclusively at certain stages in their life. So having that constant supply throughout the year of different plants that'll cycle through their blooms and just really push out high quality pollen and nectar uh, is one of the main things that makes the difference in a landscape that's going to support this biodiversity um, versus uh, kind of leave them looking elsewhere. And you don't have to take my word for it. UF has actually been doing research where unused high maintenance out of play turf areas on golf courses are getting replaced with various types of pollinator habitat. And not only are they seeing all sorts of pollinators show up, but specifically one of the goals was to demonstrate how beneficial insects will come in here and start performing pest control, not just in the pollinator plots, but in the surrounding areas and it's definitely working so they're seeing that the more diverse the plantings the more year-round this supply of nectar and pollen uh, and refuge the better the results uh, so this stuff is working and uh, it's, it's being embraced even in places like golf courses uh, so it could very much be applied in your yard in common areas uh, parks all sorts of areas another key step to supporting the good bugs is you have to um, back away from the first instinct of uh, being quick to rely on the pesticides. So for instance, on first glance, the photo on the left might get misidentified as a, a mealybug issue. You got all that white fuzzy stuff along the stem and whatnot, um, but this is actually a relatively harmless uh, bug called a plant hopper. And as a nymph, they make this little cottony fuzzy stuff on the stem, you can see it looking like some sort of weird albino, uh, you know, pale white alien shrimp thing here. And these guys are doing their thing and, you know, really aren't actually harming the plants at all, uh, but commonly misidentified as mealybugs. Now on the right, this is where we were talking earlier, uh, you've got a lot of aphids on this plant, but honestly about 90% of them are already toast. And this is actually uh, incubating a whole batch of beneficial insects. So spraying either of these things with pesticide would certainly uh, be doing more harm than good. So there's not really a need for it. And in fact, you would actually be working against your own interests. So sometimes a little bit of imperfection uh, is acceptable. And you know, if needed, you can always cut off a branch like this, toss it off in the corner of your yard, and just let the insects do their thing uh, and develop off of the bush that you're trying to keep looking nice. Now, I certainly don't want to give the impression that you should just plant some flowers and walk away and let your guard down, because uh, that's certainly not the case. Um, keeping your plants healthy does take a little bit of 
effort on your part, a little bit of work uh, to make sure that things don't get out of hand and really become a problem. Now, one of the things is you want to keep your plants nice and healthy. Uh, and keeping pests off of stressed plants is an uphill battle that beneficial insects really aren't going to win on their own. So if you've got really stressed plants, they're in the wrong plant, uh, the wrong place, and getting the wrong care, um, they are going to be attracting the pests faster than the beneficials can keep up. So we kind of talk about this uh, disease triangle or pest triangle where you really have to factor in a couple different things. There's the plant itself, there's the pathogen or the pest, and there's the environmental conditions. And all of these things have to come together in the right way to actually make something a problem. So with the right combo of those, you can get problems that get out of hand really quickly. So for example, the leaf over on the left there, certain times of year, pests like these armyworms can appear suddenly and practically defoliate your vegetables overnight. That's not something that the good bugs are probably gonna take care of on their own before you've completely lost your vegetables. But by learning what time of year those guys are active and planting around that so that you're harvesting uh, at the right time before they really become a problem, uh, and making sure that you're planting at a time where your plants aren't getting stressed out by the heat and the humidity and all that sort of thing, uh, you can tip the scales in favor of your plants being healthy and the good bugs being able to help you out. Um, so all these things kind of work together with a strategy that we call integrated pest management uh, in the green industries kind of field. So this pretty much means the whole holistic picture, taking a look at your plants, taking a look at the control methods available, trying to minimize the amount you're spraying, trying to time everything right, uh, and use non-toxic methods whenever possible. Exclusion, you know, uh, keeping the pests out to begin with, or you know, using things that target just specifically those pests. Uh, so, you know, for instance, there's things you could possibly use just on these veggies that just impact caterpillars that eat those leaves and leave the pollinators alone and all that sort of stuff. Now, another reason you don't want to just plant flowers and walk away, um, early detection is actually sometimes really important. So here's an example of when pests can also become a big issue. Florida is ground zero for all sorts of invasive species, and they can absolutely wreak havoc on our natural ecosystems and our ag industry and your home veggies uh, and landscapes all across the state. Um, for instance, you know, here in Florida, we've currently got invasive pests that are causing major problems with citrus and avocado industries, as well as impacting a lot of our nat native uh, plant communities. So early detection and rapid response on these sort of things can be really critical to helping to slow the spread and, uh, you know, again, support those good bugs by not having to get really heavy handed with controlling bad ones. One of the things that you want to try to do is really be able to recognize what looks off with the plants that you've got and what's okay, what's not okay. A really good example that I'm going to give is muscadine. I've got a muscadine vine in the backyard. Uh, and the more familiar you get with your plants and your pests, you start to get this uh, sense of when intervention might be needed or when it's not. Um, so for instance, in springtime, as soon as the muscadine vines start to bud out, a lot of times they will get all their new growth covered in these little tiny black aphids. But knowing muscadines, being familiar with these things, I know that that's pretty normal. And those aphids actually really don't seem to do any damage. Muscadine vines are extraordinarily vigorous. This really doesn't seem to impact them whatsoever. Now, on the other hand, it does just ring the dinner bell for all the beneficial insects. So by leaving those aphids, I started seeing the ladybugs show up and seeing ladybug eggs laid on the undersides of a bunch of the leaves and seeing these lacewing eggs showing up all over the place. And pretty sure, uh, you know, sure enough, pretty soon there's almost no aphids in sight and just a whole slew of beneficial predator insects that are patrolling this thing and then moving on to go around the rest of the garden. Um, 
Now, the good thing is you don't necessarily need to be an expert. There's a lot of different things that can chew on a lot of different plants and being able to know them all is a pretty daunting task, especially if you're a new gardener. So this is where uh, Extension, your local University of Florida Extension office, your master gardener volunteers, uh, and some of the different resources that are available to you can be invaluable resources uh, as you're trying to figure out what the heck is going on with your garden plants. So it's quite likely you're not the only one seeing the issue you're seeing, uh, and somebody's seen it before. And if we haven't, we probably need to know about it. Uh, so one way or another, it's really good to just take some good pictures, try to get it nice and clear, let us know what plant it's on and things like that, uh, and you know, see what you can come up with. For instance, these semicircle cutouts on some bean plants at our community garden. Uh, I got really excited when I saw these because this is classic leaf cutter bee damage. So leaf cutter bees will actually cut out these perfect little semicircles and use it to line their nests and make like a little waterproof uh, it almost looks like a little cigar tube wherever they're making their nest. And so they do minimal damage. They don't really spread disease as they're chewing up on the leaves. And pretty soon they're going to be all finished with the nests. And uh, they're really cool pollinators to see. So leaf cutter bees have this funny way of roaming around on the flowers a lot of times. They put their butt way up in the air and they've got pollen all over it. Uh, so really cool little critters. Um, you know, just being familiar with what's out there, that's what we can definitely help you out with. All right, so I want to give time to get to everyone's questions and uh, sort of wrap it up, really, what you want to take away is that if you want to grow some of these, uh, especially if you want to grow some of these uh, without doing a whole lot of managing the pests all by yourself, or maybe you want to grow some of these. You want to think about your landscape and your garden from those bugs perspective. The good bugs need certain things to hang around. If you give it to them, they'll be there when you need them. All right, so the three easy steps kind of summed up. You want to provide sources of nectar and pollen and habitat throughout the year. Identify your issues correctly uh, and see if there's good bugs already present on the scene because sometimes you don't really need to do anything, despite your first gut instinct. And then the third thing is you want to minimize the pesticides and practice IPM. So keep your plants healthy by planting the right plant, right place, right time. Use some early detection so that things don't get out of hand real uh, extreme before the good bugs or you can get in there. Uh, and then when you do need to do something, uh, use targeted least toxic methods of control. And again, you can always contact us, ask what to do. Uh, that's part of what we're here for is to let you know, you know, when the big guns might be needed, which is honestly pretty rare, uh, versus when there's other options. All right, so kind of sum it all up, you know, this really wraps into the whole core idea of Florida friendly landscaping. Uh, the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping are really designed to help save water, support wildlife, reduce guesswork, improve water quality out there, and make your ideal landscape or garden a reality. So the thing is, when you've got less guesswork involved, you're going to have less problems, and you're going to have a better landscape or garden out of it. And that's really kind of the summary of Florida Friendly Landscaping in a nutshell. Uh, that's really what we're here for is so that your landscape and your garden can be resilient, high quality, uh, doing what you want it to achieve and not constantly be getting drenched in irrigation, fertilizer and pesticides. Uh, and, and we kind of help give you the path forward to achieve that. All right, so I'm going to open it up to questions here and take a look at what you guys might have in the chat box. Uh, my contact info is up here. 